It's 801. So it's 801. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to you to kick things off. Let's bring up we'll our slide deck. There we go. We should have some slides up there. So good morning, everybody. As Craig says, thank you for welcoming. Uh, thank you for welcoming Craig. Thank you for welcoming us. Everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> I've set the bar high. For those who haven't uh, joined us before, it's very important to us as state employees, as ourselves, to take a moment and just recognize where we are connecting from. It's an important part that we all play in the role of advancing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action. So from the photo, those of you who know us well can realize that I'm not hanging out in Calgary today. I'm actually in Victoria, citing a couple of days for one of our daughters and myself. So I've set myself a challenge and I wanted to take a moment to recognize the land where I was and the heritage. So in Victoria, they acknowledge the traditional Songnee Squalamut land, which is home to the Songnee's people, the Lagwangan and the Wasanich. And I hope I was close on those pronunciations. <laughs> Sait itself, based in Calgary, where Deb and Craig are joining us from today, is situated on the traditional land of the Blackfoot people. That's shared by the Beaver people of the Sutina and the Nakota people of the Stony Nakoda. Sait recognizes everybody who makes their homes in the southern region of Alberta. Wherever you are today, thank you for just taking a moment to acknowledge, be grateful, and respect where we're from today. Craig, Excellent. back to you. Jenny is so well done as always, and uh, good on you for the uh, extra credit this morning. So that's, <laughs> that's terrific. So uh, very excited, uh, special guest joining us today, Deb Herlock. Uh, thank you so much for, for making the time. Deb is the Senior Specialist of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Pembina. And we wanted to have a conversation this morning around culture, EDI, um, you know, we, we were chatting briefly before we, we hit record that uh, Deb, the oil and energy uh, industry, historically probably would not be seen as the, uh, you know, the bastion of EDI. Very, very, um, well, how do you want to call it? Similar type of organization type of industry. But uh, Jenny came to me and said, Pemben is doing some pretty amazing things. This would be a great conversation to have. And I think that might be just a fantastic spot to start is, you know, give us a little background on, on your journey and uh, maybe where, where you've started at with Pembina, where you've gotten to, and then we can kind of use that as the, the trailhead to break off of here. So. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> thanks for that, Craig. And thanks for the introduction. I just want to say to you, it's, uh, you know, I've had a chance to work with Jenny last year, so it's an absolute pleasure to come and have this conversation today. And, and I love that we'll, you know, we'll see where it goes. I, I love conversations like that. Uh, and then Craig, I love what you mentioned at the beginning, which I do think there's this idea or perception, right? Um, of energy, oil and gas, right? And I think people probably have some ideas of what that looks like, or maybe some ideas that come to mind and you would be thinking EDI in that space, right? And I gotta tell you, that's exactly why I went into that space. And, you know, for myself, and it was really interesting, like my background is not in energy. It is not in the corporate setting. Um, it is primarily working with community-based nonprofit organizations and spent some time even in academia. And what was really interesting, and we, and we talk about this at Pemina, is uh, they took a risk on me by bringing me into their environment. And I took a risk on them, right? By moving outside of my career and going into these settings. So I think from that very first step, right, that very first positioning, we were actually modeling EDI, right? So bringing in disciplines that we might not be familiar with, right, that might not be typically recognizable to us. So I always kind of start with a little bit of that backstory, because I think it's really important to the journey itself, right? And, um, and again, just as you mentioned, like these, these are the places when we want to create change, particularly within EDI, these are the spaces we need to go into, right, where ones that might be seen as you know primarily male dominated settings right maybe primarily traditional settings and and the the beauty about this kind of work is that you can go into these settings right and start to surface that culture and you actually learn some things and you might actually be surprised because sometimes we actually might break the stereotypes right of what we think this actually is right so that's that's been a big learning on my part fantastic um so there's there's a number of ways we can go here there's the question that kind of sits in my mind around this is, 
are you changing culture? Like, are you changing the culture of the entire organization or are you creating a culture of EDI? And I, I don't, maybe I'm getting semantic in this, but I, I'm just curious as to, you know, what are the, what are the signs that you're seeing that culture is shifting uh, in the organization? Like that ultimately, and I love what you said about leaning into taking a risk on each other. Mm. Change is only going to happen if you start taking some risks, right? And, and, and getting a little uncomfortable. And Jenny's, I can see her smiling because I'm layering lots of things into this as I normally do. So I'm going to yeah. come back to my original question of, you know, what, how do you know your culture is shifting? Or, or what, are those, what are those things that you, you were trying to do to shift the culture? Maybe that gives you a couple spots to go here. Well, there's some, uh, <laughs> some good ones in there, Craig. How much time do we have? It's uh, dealer's <laughs> choice. I, I, try, I try to make it easy for you as well. Oh, gosh. These are just wonderful, generous questions. I think... Um, well, your point, you were, the, well, you, your first question, right, about changing culture, are we changing, creating a culture of EDI or changing culture? And we're actually changing culture through EDI at Pembina. Okay. And I got to say, that's probably been one of my biggest surprises, right? And that's also really important about this work is stay open to the surprises that will happen when you're in these spaces, right? And um, certainly we went in very, like, well, I actually say I went in without a map. And I think that's really important. And we'll talk a little bit about that in our conversation today. But you know, when you're intent doing the work with intention, um, I think what happens is my experience is when you're doing authentic, transformative, meaningful EDI work, culture changes, right? And I think that that's been one of, I think if you talk to people at Pemina and what I've heard from people at Pemina too, that's been one of the biggest, I think, surprises. It's also what creates engagement, momentum, and commitment to EDI, right? Because people are experiencing connection, they're experiencing compassion. They're experiencing um, feeling less alone, like whoever you are in the company, right? Um, and I think what's happening then is the culture is starting to shift, right? Like I'm hearing actually from leaders and VPs, um, things like, you know, what they're noticing is people starting to self-advocate, people starting to step up and provide feedback, people wanting to, you know, offer things to make Pemina better, right? In terms of equity and diversity and inclusion. And what I'm hearing from leaders is they haven't seen that before, right? And those are markers for me that our culture is, is changing. Does that make sense? Uh, it, make, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and Jenny, thank you. So folks, I'm just gonna take a quick pause. Feel free to put your comments in, in the chat. And I see we already have a question in the Q and A. So thank you for that. Um, Tanya's put an interesting, she, she added to the, uh, acronym in here and added a B at the end, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And so I, I think that's, I thought that was a very interesting call out. Um, Jenny, I'm going to come to your, your thoughts on what you've heard so far. And, you know, I know you and Deb have had a lot of conversation over the past couple of years. So um, what yeah, we have, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think, you know, just almost connecting dots actually. So Deb, when Debbie first started speaking, straight away came that risk. And yeah. there's so much, you know, constantly as humans, we're balancing risk reward. Yes. And, and where our culture lacks, well, to use a term that Craig and I have used frequently, and I know you and I have talked about it a lot, is, you know, that psychological safety. And that first step in psychological safety is actually termed inclusion safety. And so it comes as no surprise when we provide a safe space for conversation and we're prepared to almost navigate the risk and the courage and people showing up then the end result is we get that belonging I, I love that that turned up in the um, acronym there because what is that infamous quote diversity brings you to the table inclusion gives you a voice belonging means that you're heard mm -hmm. and I think in a lot of the you know, conversations that I've had at Pembina it is it's about that I feel like I belong now I feel like there's that space to have a conversation. And when you think about a busy company with lots of people, it really puts that label on this was transactional, like as in work, as in showing up at work every day, it was just transaction, transaction, transaction. And we're seeing something different. We're seeing a real sincerity, a real care. And those lie under trust. They lie under psychological safety. So I think it's a really good measure funny that you can't put a number on it because we want to measure by numbers but <laughs> but it's those stories it's the stories that bring it to life mm -hmm. um i'm curious though within all of this like it, it i, I want to say in my head oh we have a pembina model this looks really cool and 
there's so much hard work in there too. Like this isn't easy for people. Where, where's, I suppose, where has the struggle been? Can you, can you put a finger on that and talk to us a bit? Because I think a lot of people back away because of that risk, because of the, it's got to be a fear, a fear of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that question, uh, Jenny. And I think that, you know, and it's real. Actually, a lot of the questions that I get from folks at Pemina um, come from a fear place. Like there is a reality, right? Like I've literally had people come to me and say, um, hey, am I going to lose my job? Yeah. You know, am I, am I, am I never going to get promoted, right? Um, one of the most common things I hear too is, um, you know, I'm really afraid to say the wrong thing. Right. And I think people yeah. probably hear that a lot in EDI work. Right. And I hear it particularly from the leaders. Uh, and so here's my response to that is when, when people do um, share it, they're afraid to say something, um, particularly within culture work. The thing is, is that if you don't say anything, we go into states of paralysis. Right. Which yeah. means that the culture stays or it actually gets worse. Right. Or becomes like very, very unhealthy. And so what I always say to the leaders is there's a few things. One is, you know, then make what's underneath the source of fear and discomfort. We always encourage people to do that. So not just go, well, I'm scared. Okay, why are you scared? What's underneath that? And then sometimes we'll go to spaces, well, I'm afraid if I say the wrong thing, I'm gonna get called out, right? And we can talk about sort of that language of getting called out. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurt somebody. I'm gonna harm the work and I'm gonna really hurt someone, right? And so my advice is then, you know, do enough of the work, right? Do enough of the learning. And we're supporting people at Pemina in doing that, that you have some <laughs> foundational concepts right, to be able to wrestle with, so that you have a foundational understanding of the difference between equality and equity and inclusion um, and understanding microaggressions, things like that, have that, have that fundamental understanding and then step in. But then here's where the concept of accountability is critical, right? This is when we really get to flex our EDI muscle is in the accountability space. So if you are afraid, let's walk through it, and you say something and it has been, and you have offended or hurt someone, guess what starts now? the accountability, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that that has the opportunity to create the depth of culture and the true transformative EDI work, right? And yeah. I've experienced this at Pemina. Like I myself have made mistakes too. And that's what's important for people to know, right? But what held the accountability in a very graceful and compassionate way was the relationships that we built because we have, you know, it's being transformative, being relational is what guides us. It's our mantra throughout all the work. So that when we have those moments of making a mistake, saying the wrong thing, right? That the relationships hold us and we move through the accountability, right? And we're better for it. Our relationships are deeper, right? But that's, yeah. and then that's hard. That accountability and holding space is hard because often it means holding someone's pain. It means you've created hurt. Yeah. yeah. And you got to hold space and sit and listen. like. <laughs> And, and those are, I kind of want to swear, but I won't swear. <laughs> it works with me, I've never known I like to swear, but I want to say how hard that is, right? But yeah, that, that's one of the ways that accountability looks. And there's, and when you talk about the struggle, there's so many webbed ways of struggling because if it's transformative work, it means there's going to be grief. Absolutely. Right? You're going to, oh. you know, right? Like it's like, you're looking, you know, you, you might have to go, geez, oh my gosh, um, I'm, learning and coming to the terms with the fact that my grandfather was super racist. Well, we shit. What does this mean for me and who am I? Right? Yeah. 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 And I think, Deb, I want to take you right back. Sorry, Craig, if, uh, oh. if that's okay, because you mentioned that fear of being called out. There was yeah. so much in what you just said, so much that I want to pick up on. Um, but I think this is really important. And it is one of the first things that that I literally, I learned from you and, and I've just spread the term everywhere I've gone because I think it's brilliant. And so you always talk about the difference between calling someone out and calling someone in. Can you just give us a nugget for the people on, on here today? What's the difference between the two? Because th yeah. this is a game changer, like any culture for yeah. anything. It doesn't have to be the yeah. EDI related. I think mm -hmm. it's huge. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, we use it a lot. So, so Cole's Nerds version, and I also, also want to contextualize this, that, you know, to when we're talking about calling in and calling out to, to come to it with a context of caution too, right? Because there is writing because what we don't want to do is we don't want to polarize and go, there's this or that, because there's actually some situations where calling out is required in this work, yeah. right? But the big work is discerning, you know, which one do you want to engage in, in a moment of whether that's conflict, tension, microaggression, do you want to move forward in calling in or calling out, right? 
the other thing is to, so that's the first thing. The other thing to know is know your culture, know your organization, right? And when you're using calling in or calling out, what are you trying to create within your culture, mm -hmm. right? And so the reason why we use calling in at Pemina after getting to know the culture, right? Spending some time, calling in is a good fit for this company. It might not be for everybody else, but it's a good fit for us. And the reason being is when we make those mistakes, right? Right, when we I might say something that hurts someone, we want to call someone in so they learn. It's the learning that's underneath it too, right? So yeah. really quickly calling in will be, it's here's how we try to look at it. Permanent. It's a conversation, right? Um, it tends to be private. Now that can like, again, discernment, right? So if you're in a group situation, if it's a really safe group and you feel like you can go into calling in in front of people and with people, then I think you have to make that call, right? If you feel like you can't, then you know what's really great to is to have take a moment. Um, and I've had these conversations with people at Pound and people have had conversations with me too. Like I had people go, hey Deb, do you have a few minutes? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what you said there, and I'm like, holy shit. I, okay, wow. I'm sorry. Thank you for that, right? Uh, calling in is again, what I love about calling in is it is an extension of our transformative approach and ethos at Pemina, right? So it focuses on healing and repair because often you need calling in because a harm has happened, yeah. right? And we're going to hurt each other in this work. I know that's hard to say, but we will. And that's why we need the accountability and grace. Often it's a response and not a reaction to, right? So sometimes calling out and trust me, it's an evolution of my own career. I spent a lot of time calling people out very early in my career. Mm -hmm. I was angry and I was reactionary and you know, fighting sexism, racism, and homophobia, right? Um, but now it's it's a response. And I think one of the most important things about it, and here's where I think it drives culture change, is it's it's um, a mutual learning experience. So every time I'm in a calling in conversation, whether someone's calling me in or I'm calling them in, I always, always learn. And I've seen people do it at Pemina. Like I've seen, I wouldn't talk about it unless we've experienced it and seen it. And it's incredible, the impact that it's had. And I think what I really like there is, um, we've mentioned him a few times, but John Amici's come out with some really good work in this area as well. And, and when he defines empathy, he says, you know, there's foundations for empathy. Mm. And we have to start with that benign ignorance. Like, I, I don't know from your side. I don't know where you came from. I, like, I literally, I don't know. I know my version. I know my perception. Mm. I don't know yours. And then that very healthy has a different word for it, but it's a healthy mm. curiosity. And then the last bit, and this is to keep it that growth mindset. And I think that's what you were just talking to there is that at the end of this, mm -hmm. I am actually prepared to be changed myself. And it doesn't matter which side of the conversation you're on. I, my mind could be changed. My mind could, I could grow. I could learn from that. And when we start with that perspective, I think that we all, I don't want to use the term, but we do all win in that conversation. We all grow and that the win is the growth that we get and the learning that we get within there. Yeah. And I love what you're talking about, Jenny. And I would even say, you know, I think what's what had the biggest impact at Pemina is we changed hearts. Yes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about um, changing minds. I think we're also changing hearts, but you have to have the, you, it, and the word will and willingness is so important in this work. You have to have the willingness to change. Yeah. And that's like what you said earlier, what we don't talk about though, is the pain sometimes that com comes with change and transforming oh. as a person as the culture transforms. Right. Yeah. But, and, and that holding space for people in those unpleasant emotions has to be one of the hardest parts of the work I would imagine for a lot of people, excuse me. <clears throat> There, there's a few questions here. Uh, the chat's going great, and there's a few questions here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop into one if I can right now, because I think, I think we're gonna. It, it kind of dovetails a bit on what you, we were just talking about, and that is, you know, in your opinion, what's the reason for the fear and resistance to EDI? Uh, and the, the, the question I actually would like to hear from all three of us on this, and I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop in first here, and I think um, you, what really resonated for me in what you were talking about there, Deb, is the fear of making a mistake, right? That's, and I, I put that from the perspective as I, I don't think I resist EDI. I think I do, um, you know, have some fears at time of saying the wrong thing at the wrong place and not knowing what to say at times. So that's, I think that that fear piece is a, is a big one of them. Um, Jenny and Deb, I guess, any other thoughts that come to mind around the resistance to EDI? Mm. What, what if I do a small dive in and then we'll let Deb take the stage? <laughs> She's going to have the, the full answer. But, you know, I think, Craig, that's really important. I think a lot of people 
hold in that space. And there's, there's something about if I get it wrong and there's that silence, but fear generally comes from sort of three areas. It's a lack of control, a lack of an end in sight and a lack of predictability. And Deb mentioned a load of those at the beginning. Will I lose my job? What happens if I get it wrong? I don't know how this conversation goes. And, you know, my husband and I have had some phenomenal conversations with our 13 year old and she has taught us so much in such a short time. We, yeah. we knew nothing compared to what she talks about these days. Like I'll go to her and say, so, you know, can one say this? How does this work? Or I'll be saying something she's like, Jenny, it's a good job. It's you and me in the car. Cause we would be in trouble if we were in public right now. I'm like, <laughs> okay, fill me in. And, and so yeah. It, it's becoming comfortable with those unknowns um, as well. Deb, all yours. Ooh. Again, such a great question, Craig. I'm going to try. <laughs> um, so with, with this work, um, I'm just going to preface this. Like I try to see this work as a continuum. So if you could imagine a continuum from, you know, people that are in the space of resistance, right? And then there's fear in that space, right? All the way to, to advocates within our setting, right? And then we always talk about our movable middle. That's right in between is where, is where a lot of people sit at Pemina. But let's just talk about the fear. And here's what I've been getting. And because it's really important to get to know those voices, we're going to talk, like, I think we'll talk about yeah. that, right? Too. I spent quite a bit of time meeting, building relationships, talking with um, our employees that are racialized and are and historically marginalized and oppressed, right, to understand their voices. I've also wanted to understand um, the, the employees at Pemina that are in the spaces of being like white, cisgendered, heterosexual men, right? Because um, they feel fear differently than our other folks do at Pemina, right? So I wanted to spend some time there to get underneath it. And it's because it's important. It's important to how you do the work, right? We can't ignore it. Engaging them is a really critical part of changing. And the reality of it is that's 70% of our population right now at Pemina, right? And so if that, you know, so if there's fear there, it's important to understand it. And my sense is, you know, it's really, it's interesting because yeah, for some people, there's a, there's a strong resistance to EDI, right? And the fear underneath it is coming from um, loss. What will I lose, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a scarcity mode. It's EDI feels like a threat. It feels like I may literally lose my job. Um, I won't get promoted. So there's those are there's those those pieces. Um, but then when I spend more time talking, there's a real fear of irrelevance, right? Yeah. Like yeah. And 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 we would be remiss not to talk about power and privilege right now, yeah. right? So if we can go there, because when when certain groups have had power and privilege, right? And something is coming along that feels like a threat to that. It's really scary, right? So it's like, holy shit, what am I going to lose? So we're spending a lot of time um, building relationships to say, hey, and it's, I think we may talk about the giving tree. It's not that your apples are going to get taken away, right? <laughs> it's just that there's going to be more apples for everyone, right? Like it's and and that's a lot. That's a big piece of the work. Like that's like the building the relationships. And, and some people will, you know what, honestly, will stay in a space of resistance and fear and not move. And that's okay too. But then there's the people that were like, they will start to get it, right? And then they start to move along, right? But again, if when doing this work within an organization, within a setting, it's so important to know that and to understand it because then engaging them is really important. And that's what, you know, for, I would say our more dominant population at Pemina, when they do say they're afraid, I always say, the best way to be relevant with EDI, if you're afraid of it right now, is get involved, be an ally. That's yeah. your relevancy. Imagine, holy shit, imagine if you do that. So engaging men as allies is actually a really critical approach in our work because we are male dominated at this point in time, right? So engaging them in a meaningful way as allies then helps them to experience the relevancy. And then at the same time, it starts to mitigate and reduce the fear and the scarcity and threat mode. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. There's so much in there. I want to come back to this giving tree in a, in a second because that is, is really tweaked my interest. But you also talked about um, trying to hear from folks. And it, it ties in with the question here in that as a leader, how do you make those marginalized voices? How do you make sure those marginalized voices are being heard? Um, how do you create safety to elevate those voices? And, and just maybe if, if some practical thoughts and tips on how, how you did that. Because it sounds like you spent some time, if I understood what you were saying there, it sounds like you spent some time specifically doing this. So mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I lo oh, again, love this because it's an opportunity if we can, Jenny and Craig, to go there to talk about um, something we created at PEMNA, which is called Conversations for Change. Yeah. Uh, and when you talked about, it was one of your initial questions, Craig, like, what did I do at the beginning? And I would say, well, one of the things I did is, um, one of the very first things I did was looked at ways that we could center the voices of our racialized and historically marginalized employees at Pemina. So that was actually one of our very, very first steps. Like we were doing a few other things, but that was probably one of our most intentional. And we did that through the creation of our Conversations for Change series. And, and what happened is that, that initiative by centering those voices created the floodgates. I really feel that that started our culture shift at Pemina with in the, the EDI work. So um, like an example would be one of the very first, very first conversations for change that we held at Pembina. And again, I think about your question at the beginning, Craig, where you're like, this is an energy company, it's oil and gas. And we have people across Canada and the States and we're in rural sites, like all those kinds of things. And, you know, I had only been at Pembina a couple months and we had a panel for International Women's Day. And what we centered were the voices of women sitting at multiple places of intersectionality, right? So in terms of race, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and this panel came together and talked about living in those spaces. They, we centered their, their voices, their lived experiences. So you got to imagine, these are not experiences or voices that people typically talk about or hear about at Pemina, right? And so here's the, and then, oh gosh, there's so much to this. Here's the other piece that's really important though, is that for these women to come forward, the courage that that takes and the bravery, you talk about risk, right? Like, I'm going to say things that are really hard about racism. I'm going to say things that are really hard about being a Muslim woman or being a queer woman. Am I going to lose my job? Like, right? Like you got to imagine what's going through their mind, but we center their voices. Um, but we did it through, again, a transformative approach. So lots of prep time building as a group. So they felt safe to do the panel. They're not just like, we don't just kind of turn the camera on and then we have these panel discussions. Um, but they shared that. And then what happened was it just literally blew up in all the good ways you could imagine. Like, hundreds and hundreds of people turned out hundreds of people reached out to the women afterwards people were like i had no idea i've been working with this person for 10 years and i didn't know that about them and because they talked about what was hard and their lived experience and we had moments a lot of moments of tears in those hard conversations people were vulnerable and it created then the medium for connection because they were vulnerable in their pain and what is hard and so there was connection the seeding of empathy started to happen compassion and then we started to hear from people going I want to be an ally. I didn't know that this is what people experienced, right? And so we started that with International Women's Day and then we kept that going. So we centered voices of LGBTQ2S employees. We centered voices of people, you know, experiencing mental health challenges. You know, we centered the voices of our Indigenous employees, right? And then we even had a conversation about the impact of male norms, right? Gender norms on men, right? And so it just, it just continued. And I think it was a major culture shifter, but if there was advice to anyone that's doing this work, centering the voices of the ones, right? Those um, marginalized voices that we typically don't hear centering them is probably one of the most significant things you can do to shift culture. I could yeah. do it. <laughs> Craig, that was a long one. You had to know. No, I'm, yeah, <laughs> there, there, yeah, this is, we, uh, we could have a two, three hour conversation <laughs> I'm sure, so. We uh, so could. Uh, <laughs> You looked like you wanted to get in there. And Thank we're, uh, but we're both sitting here same, same, thinking the same thing. Just let her talk. Just let, just let Deb keep talking. There's so much in here. This might be one recording I come back to and listen to and actually like take away from it. But, but a couple of key things. One is that, that centering piece. That's obviously really important. Um, but the other piece in there, <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the other piece within there is this all happened during the pandemic, too. So, Deb, you joined Pep, but no, you hadn't even been to the you'd never been to the office for about the first year of work, I think. So when we talk about relationships, one of the things that people keep getting stuck on is we, it's really difficult when you're working virtually. It's really difficult when you've got that hybrid piece. And, and this example actually, <clears throat> excuse me, blows that out of the water as well, because this was all done virtually before we've even got to that that face-to-face -face piece. And I think that's a really important piece for us to take away too, is that we can do it without having to be face-to-face. -face. So there's always, there's a richness in face-to-face, -face, absolutely. But that was a powerful tool in there as well. Um, so yeah, that was just a piece I wanted to add within there. 
Yeah, I think it's really important, Jenny Noel. And I will say, I'll never forget the feeling of for all the people that, you know, we probably had about 30 employees in total that that, that participated in conversations for change. Then we had thousands of views, but you know, that feeling of being able to hug them for the first time was incredible. And I will say <laughs> it was just because, and, and, but I think it is, when you think about, yeah, it happened virtually, but it's what you talk about and how you talk about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yep. We went right to, again, the lived experiences, right? The spaces of resiliency, what is hard. And, and what I would say, and it's, you know, it's definitely a shout out to my vice president, Jen Forrest, who trusts me infinitely um, to create the space, co-create the space for people to talk about what's hard, right? Yeah. <laughs> and in yeah. a company, and not a lot of companies do that. A lot of companies are afraid. There's the fear thing, right? And we didn't, we weren't confined by that. And um, it was quite contagious. Like the courageous, the courage was contagious, right? And it was because it's what we talked about. And because we were vulnerable, we talked about what was hard, what was, what has hurt us in our lives. Like we went to those spaces and as a result, that's where the connections happen, right? That's where the connection and relationship happens is in those stories. And I think that's why, Jenny, I love that question because I'd love to think about it more, but I think that's why in spite of being virtual, deep relationships mm -hmm. um, and friendships have been formed, I think. I don't know. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and and Pembina, like Pembina actually has a competency that says courage, acts courageously. It's yeah. a competency. Yeah. And, and what keeps sort of showing up in this conversation as well is that, you know, that is that we're back to that risk that you mentioned right at the beginning. When we take the risk, when we stop concealing, we spend so much energy concealing, concealing. And it's not just in EDI work, it's in everything. Craig and I are always saying, have the conversation. Because when we have the conversation, we have the opportunity to reveal. Now, we've still got one further step to take. You still have to have that courage to step in and reveal rather than conceal. But I keep noticing you keep mentioning the vulnerability. And once we hit that vulnerability, we get connection. And when we get connection, we get belonging. And there's no surprises that come then when, you know, the cohesion that's going to build and the respect that builds. And for all of those who've been tracking us on the psychological safety conversation, you can't have psychological safety until you have those in place and so the richness that just builds as a it's almost like an undercurrent isn't it that then lifts people and that's what we're hearing is we get that lift and that connection it's very cool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah there's so much going by here on the chat and and the, the questions I don't come back to this uh this bit how did you get how did you encourage folks to get involved and tell their story through the conversations for change? Mm -hmm. okay. that, that, you know, that was yeah. probably scary for most. So how, how did you, how did you enlist that, that um, support, I guess? Yeah, great question. Um, so, well, a few things, we use a developmental approach when we do the conversations for change. So what I mean by that, like, so the very first one actually was, was literally a result of um, conversations and relationships I was building with people across Pemina. Cause remember I came, I said, I came in, just spent time seeking to understand folks. Right. So I started to build relationships because people were reaching out to me too. Right. Like, you know, um, our black, my, like our black employees or our queer employees, like, I think they were like, Oh, Hey, there's an EDI person. I'm going to reach out and just, we just started chatting and having, come. and so I started to build a bit of a network and then invited at least for the first one, the women in. Right. And you know, what's really interesting too is, well, there's an interesting side story that like one of our panelists who was like, no, I don't think I can do this stuff. No, no, too, too scary, you know, and then started to think about it and went on a journey because the group goes on a journey, right? When they decide what questions they're going to ask, they, as a group, some of them hadn't met, but by the end have deep, deep relationships. So you can imagine what they're digging into to prep for this. You know, one of our, one of the women who did say yes, as a result of experiencing courage, right, um, has gone on to lead one of our inclusion networks and start one of our inclusion networks, our multicultural resource group, right? And she attributes participating in conversations for change. So that was the first one. And then you know what happened was, um, what then we would start to do is we'd let people know a few months ahead of time that the topic was coming up. And if literally it was just an open, like if you're interested to reach out and people would just started reaching out to me and saying, hey, I think I wanna do this. And there'd be people that would come on and say, I'm scared to do this, but I need to do this stuff. I need to do this. And so now people look forward to it. They're, you know, not only to, to experience and watch them, but to be on the panels, right? And <laughs> I gotta tell you, some of the most moving things have been like at our field sites, 
You know, they have watch parties when we do the conversations for change. We have 50 people coming into a room and they're sending us pictures, like they're ordering in food and pizza and like taking this all in, in like Valley View, Grand Prairie, like Prince Rupert, like right across like it. I'm just like, oh, I know that's what I do too, Craig. Yeah. <laughs> Once day this day, I was like, wow. So I think there's a hunger for this too. Sorry, and then I will stop talking. But what I was going to say too is, I was so surprised by the response to the very first one we had. And that's when we knew we had something, that something was happening. And then it told us something about the culture again, right? So always looking for ways that the culture is surfacing. And I was like, oh, they're hungry for this. Yeah. Well, I think the key thing I heard there too was the work that you did with those individual conversations leading up to it, right? You, you created that safe space. You created that psychological safety. You created trust with the, the, the people that you were inviting into the conversation so it this 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 wasn't an overnight success right there there was a lot of groundwork that went into this and I think sometimes we get into these conversations and think okay we're gonna start yeah. tomorrow yeah. right but it, it it takes time to get there you know Craig I think that would be the most important thing to let people know is like the ethics in doing something like this right the ethics of what you're opening up when you're inviting people to come talk about hard things in a setting like this, right? So we use what we call a participatory group process. So we start months ahead of time and we start working with the panelists, right? So, and, and honestly, I sort of have, my commitment to them is we can pull the plug at any moment. We're, and I'm talking minutes before we go live at these events. If you do not feel safe and comfortable, your safety is paramount to me, right? And, and so they as a group go through that. And then what we also do is we do an, an immediate debrief, right? because it's hard, like people, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot to work through. And then we do a debrief a few weeks later. And then some of these groups, we've just, they've stayed as a group and keep going. And then we do a survey um, to understand the impact that this, that the conversations for change have. And then we bring that back to the panelists to say, look at <laughs> yeah. what your conversation did, look at the change. And, and, and then honestly, they get, we have hundreds of people reaching out to them after they've done a talk, like personally, or people saying, I experienced that too. You know, I have a child who's transitioning. It was nice to know I'm not alone. And so now we have peer-to-peer -peer accountability, right? And relationships building as a result. Very cool. And, and I think the cool piece of that too, because I know we'd have a lot of people in here today who don't hold a position where they could start that straight away. Like it's a, it's a great idea to build on, but it's that simple um, it's creating the space and it's building the connection and, and the connection comes in that we have this in common. And so when we hear those and then we know we have that in common. And so I like the way that it's worked. It was an opportunity, but it's not just the opportunity. People are then taking their opportunity and making space for that conversation and that even if it's just a small connection or a small reach out it makes a it makes a huge difference I think in the work that you're doing as well at your level another question here because you know, I think it ties in well with a comment that you made earlier Deb was about the support from your VP mm -hmm. is does this change need to happen in a top-down way or can a junior employee uh, feels who feels the lack of EDI take charge and create these initiatives. Ooh, okay, that's a great question. I think that's a question that a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah. Want. You know, yeah. So sure, like I think in an ideal world, I think you have people that where you're working sort of the ground up culturally, um, and then you meet the support of, of leaders. But I know that that's not a reality in all the organizations. Um, and so you know having a very like yeah my best vice president for the area that I'm in um, is a very vocal visible advocate for this um, and then she advocates to our execs and to our board right um, so there had but you know when we started too I would say like there was varied support through the leadership right like I, I don't think we started with like yes like we're committed and we see the value right we, we had work to do um, and so I think you I think you can so here's 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 a bit of my response to that. So if you're going into an organization and you don't feel like there's the, the visible support of the leadership or the real authentic support of the leadership, right? That they're maybe treating it like a checkbox, then yeah, invest in the ground culture, I would say, right? Um, I know that that's exactly what I did when I went in. Um, Jen was spending a lot of time advocating for EDI with our execs. And then we eventually merged because we created an EDI strategic plan for five years. But I spent time 
building relationships right at the ground level and then what happened is a groundswell started to happen right so i don't love the language but it was because i don't like the hierarchical language but it was a bit of a, like a bottom up that was happening right and then what happened is leaders and execs actually started to get swept into that and started to experience the value of it like through the conversations for change Right. Um, and so I think what it did is it furthered their commitment and valuing and momentum. But it, it does like ideally, yes, you do want somebody at an executive level that's going to advocate and truly understand and advocate for EDI from a transformational perspective, not as a checkbox like. This is just about the targets because it's not. <laughs> that's the big key piece, isn't it, is that transformational and the we come back full circles, the relational piece. And so, and that's the, there's the time. This cannot be checkbox. It doesn't work. It's that superficial. Yeah. No, you actually do damage. I think you actually Fair. report yeah. more damage in a culture and more resentment of the EDI work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting into our last five minutes or so. And I've got a page full of notes here that I haven't even gotten to. And I wanted to ask you about your surprises. You made a comment earlier about doing this without a map. Uh, measurement, I think it's an interesting one that we could maybe explore again at some point in the future. We didn't even get to the giving tree. I, I'm saying all this because Deb, there's a, there's a great argument here for us to continue this conversation at another point because I would love to have you back. Um, but there's a couple other questions here I think that tie well into where we want to close off with. So I'm going to jump to the audience question here. And Brad has one is that, you know, what has changed over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years? to make this quote unquote, the right time for corporations to embrace EDI? Wow, okay, now that is a fantastic question and one we don't usually get. Um, you know, I think, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw on a bit of my previous experience, I, you know, because I've been doing this work for, you know, about 20 years, like outside of corporate settings, right? Uh, and so, you know, this work has always been going on. What's new is that it's migrating into corporate settings. And I think that we're in a time now of social accountability like we've never seen before. Um, so whether that's ESG, so environmental social governance and EDI is a part of that. So you look at environmental commitments, social commitments, um, you, can, you can actually trace the movement of it moving into to the corporate setting. And you know, I think it started, you know, I don't know if folks are familiar with like employment equity, right? Regulations in Canada, right? So, you know, wanting to ensure the increased representation of designated groups. In the States, we have affirmative action. So th that kind of stuff has always been going. But I think where it's really caught traction in the last few years is because we're starting to talk about, we're talking about equity, but we're starting to talk about justice, right? Mm -hmm. In those spaces, justice and social accountability. And people want to work in corporations, not just for the money, they want to work in corporations. They want to work in settings that are like, not to sound cliche, but making the world a better place, yeah, right? Purpose. Meaningfulness. Like, it's like, why am I here in the world, right? Why am I showing up to work every day? And even if you're an oil and gas company, right? You can still come to work and make the world a better place by engaging in EDI and ESG. But there's definitely been a movement towards that corporate social accountability. It's been quite visible in the last five years, but important to know that all this work has been happening and we're borrowing from it and bringing it to the corporate setting now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No, really well said. Any, anything there before we? No, I think you just, Deb, I was connecting dots with that term, employee experience and, and this, this just feeds and it doesn't feed there. It's just sort of kind of symbiotic, isn't it? That's what it's about for people now is the experience when they go to work. And, and that that's different really in a, in corporate language, as you say. So I, I like that. So much stuff starts outside and just <laughs> come, come on in. We're a little behind, but we're, we're getting there. So uh, I hate to wrap up so soon, but you know, there's one last question here, Jenny, that I think that ties well into our one big idea and practical strategies, and that is, you know, tips on org how organizations can build buy-in and commitment to EDI. So maybe we just transition to our uh, last couple slides here to to bring it home. Let's see if we can get there. Fingers crossed. It did this to me last time, Craig, didn't it? That's okay. Let's see. Hang on. We might have to go backwards. All right. We're going to go backwards. Close your eyes, everybody. You're going to get motion sickness. <laughs> one more. There's your one big idea. Deva got you. 
Absolutely. So I think it's probably easiest if we, Deb, if you want to just give us a summary on each, we'll start with your big idea. We've got two things for people to take away and then we can leave those them with those three questions that you sent. I love it. Okay. So in just terms of the, the one big idea and, you know, Craig, Jenny, we've chatted about this, um, is when you're doing the EDI work, and I don't mean to scare people by saying this, it's unending. It's not a project. It's not an initiative, right? Uh, and that it's a journey. And we always talk about it as a journey at Pemina and to encourage people because it's a journey that you can all step in no matter where you're at in this journey. You don't have to have it all figured out. Just step yeah. in and be part of the journey. Excellent. Let me see if we can move the slide deck now. Apparently my computer doesn't want to play. Hold on. There you go. Ah, okay. So I think we, we talked about a lot of this today so I probably or yeah. already this morning but uh you know again um if you're thinking about to whether you're just starting this work or coming in really focusing on creating those spaces for people to connect right but the connection happens by creating spaces for people to talk about what's honestly what's hard you know their lived experience what have they learned so going to those spaces and then the connections and the empathy compassion will start to build out from that and, and I think you know just to add on to that th this is one that anybody can take away because creating a space is, is literally stopping to listen. And when it is hard, just being there, we don't have to speak. We just have to hold the space and, and let people, you know, work through it or, or be with them in that space too. There's the second one. I love that we haven't talked about this, the EDI series. No, we didn't talk too much about this actually at all. Uh, so I'll just, I'll be really quick. Um, another thing that we're doing at Pemin is we created an EDI foundation series. Um, and again, we brought a transformational lens to that. So, you know, if you're to look at how much content, there's about eight hours of content, but what's important is that it's the, the content's the same, but it's what's more important is the conversations that come around the content. And we actually space it out. So it's not just like, oh, here's a two hour workshop and things like that. We try to mitigate any of that kind of language. And we have the EDI Foundation series. Um, we offer like EDI 100, and then we have a few weeks away from it. And then we go back to the team and we do 200. So people have the soak time, right? The chance to take the learning into practice, bring back what's hard about it, wrestle with it. But we try to encourage that the EDI Foundations, again, so much, there's a conversational theme here, is embedded within a conversational approach. So yes, there's the content, important to have common understanding of the foundational concepts, but then hold space for the unique conversations that are going to come around it depending on who's there i like that the unique piece because it's always different it yeah. has to be yeah that's cool and then finally there's no need for you to read all three of them but what a phenomenal set of questions there anything that you want to add as you look at, at look at the screen and what we leave people to noodle for the rest of the day i think you know just the one thing is to know yourself in this work because it's so hard and that's the first question, right? Is know your why for EDI. Why is it important to you? Um, how, do, how does your location, your social identity in the world, your dimensions of diversity um, influence the EDI work? You know, that's, that's the most important. You're your anchor in this work for when it gets hard. So knowing that is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Deb. Ah, uh, lots of lots of great <laughs> shouts here. You know, um, who did I see here? It was a great comment. I'm just it's flowing past so quickly now. Mike uh, wants to know if Deb can come back again next week. We will <laughs> we'll work on finding Love time. time. <laughs> but uh, clearly, Love you've struck a uh, a very important and popular chord here, and I really want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, as always, I appreciate you and, uh, you know, getting up an hour early. So enjoy Victoria. And, we will. Uh, everybody who's joined us this morning, thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great day. And uh, we will talk to everybody soon. We will. Thank yeah. you, Craig. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Jenny. Fantastic conversation. Loved it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye.